Elliot Coburn to move the motion. Thank you, Mrs. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I beg to move that this house has considered waste incineration and recycling. And it's a pleasure to see many familiar faces in today's debate. Uh, Mrs McVeigh, I think this is the third time we've debated incineration in this chamber since the elections, and it was a pleasure to attend them both. Uh, and indeed, it's great to see the Minister in her place, uh, who I know has been on the receiving end of my uh, many frustrations when it comes to this topic, both here in the main chamber and in the many conversations we've had offline. So I'm very grateful for her being here to respond yet again to a debate of the, on this topic. Uh, the Minister, and indeed this House, will know full well my frustrations with the incinerator in Beddington, in my Carshorton and Wallington constituency. Uh, indeed, uh, next to the additional £500 million for my local hospital and to build a new local hospital, this is one of the topics I speak about most in this House. So I won't revisit many of the arguments that I know the Minister and many of my colleagues here with me today will already have heard in past debates, but I do want to address some developments with my local incinerator that I've not yet had the chance to raise in this House before going on to discuss the impact of incineration on recycling rates. The Minister will know the concerns I have raised with her in the past about emissions breaches of incinerators, the need for independently run air quality monitoring stations near these sites rather than leaving them to be um, self-reporting by the operator, the need to focus on the circular economy, reducing the amount of waste we produce in the first place, and indeed the all-important knock-on effect of operating incinerators such as traffic movements in the surrounding area. Uh, Carshorton and Wallington residents, I think it's fair to say, were promised quite a lot when the Lib Dems approved the building of an incinerator in Beddington. Uh, they were promised things like the Beddington farmlands, which is now several years overdue. They were promised things like new wildlife habitats for re to rebuild rare species, uh, only for the water level, levels surrounding ground-nesting birds for protection were allowed to drop and predators attack and destroy their nests last year. They were promised things like robust reporting on carbon, only for there to be, by my calculation, 184 incidences where they exceeded the 150 meg carbon monoxide limits and 733 invalid carbon monoxide reports in 2020 alone. Things like, they were promised things like a stronger local road network to cope with the traffic, only for residents on Bennington Lane to constantly face problems with their traffic and air pollution and much more besides. It's no surprise, therefore, Mrs McVeigh, that residents feel let down and even angry that the concerns they continue to raise continue to be brushed aside and not acted upon. But there have been new developments at Beddington which have caused alarm, and the one I want to focus on today is the new South London Waste Plan. This plan is supposed to bring together the lead members from four councils in South London, Sutton, Kingston, Croydon and Merton, and ultimately decide a strategy on how to deal with their waste. And in short, Mrs McVeigh, the strategy is to make Sutton, particularly Beddington Lane, the dumping ground of South London. Under the plan, Sutton will ambitiously take over 700,000 tonnes of waste from these four boroughs. That's over half of all the waste that these four boroughs produce. Croydon is taking about 19%, Merton is taking about 26%, but the real winners here are Lib Dem run Kingston Council, who are taking a measly 2.6% of all waste produced across four London boroughs. To add an insult to injury, Beddington is also increasing its maximum capacity by around 45,000 tonnes to take it to 347,422 tonnes of waste per year. Together with the waste plan, the increase in Beddington's maximum capacity and indeed the approval of a new sewage site in Beddington Lane, this means that around a million tonnes of waste a year is projected to be sent here. To put that into perspective, as that's quite a large number, that's around 500 heavy good vehicle movements a day just for waste let alone all the other industrial sites that require heavy good vehicles in Beddington. And even the applicants during the planning committee for the Suez Plan inferred that this could equate to a vehicle movement every three minutes. The uplift in the maximum capacity at Beddington was approved by the Environment Agency on the 9th of December, and I would urge them to reconsider granting this uplift. However, it's baffling to me that the South London Waste Partnership, which oversaw the plan, they then went on to meet over a week later from this decision being taken on the 17th of December and suddenly decided that it wasn't entirely happy with the increase in Beddington's capacity. 
Mrs McVeigh, I'm slightly confused as to why they didn't know that the decision had been taken over a week beforehand and what the point of this partnership is if the lead councillors from these four boroughs have no control or influence over the decisions of this nature. But Mrs McVeigh, to many residents, this appears nothing more than a convenient distraction to allow the Lib Dems to pursue what they can only imply is their ambition to make Sutton the dumping ground of South London and give their mates in Kingston a hand at the expense of roads and air pollution in Sutton. I had hoped that we might get answers to these questions last night, where the Conservative group on Sutton Council brought a motion to our full council stating their opposition to the increase and asking that Sutton gets a fair share. However, during what I can only call a childish, well, let's call it a debate, uh, the Lib Dems reverted back to their usual diktat when it comes to the incinerator. Nothing to see here, not me, Gov. We're ambitious about our waste plans here, mate. They then proceeded to vote for an amendment which removed the very line that called for Sutton to get a fair share. Just let that sink in for a bit. The Lib Dems essentially voted against Sutton having a fair deal when it comes to waste management. That is disgraceful. The Bennington farmlands have been delayed. Wildlife habitats have been attacked, air quality monitoring is negligent, roads are unable to cope, and now we have a projected almost million tonnes of rubbish making its way to Sutton, much of it to be burnt. Mrs McVeigh, under any measurement, this is a bad deal for Beddington, for Hackbridge, and indeed for Carshorton and Wallington as a whole. But I now want to move on to talk more about the wider impact of incineration on recycling rates, as we haven't really had the, ish the chance to discuss this issue in previous debates. Uh, indeed, the proponents of incinerators often point to recycling as a metric of their success and how they're better than landfill. Now, whilst the latter is certainly true, as landfill is the worst of all options, the same cannot be said for recycling rates. As landfill sites have begun to close and begin to be phased out, incineration has picked up much of that demand, with incineration rates raised, rising nearly four times over, from 12% to 44% over the last decade. However, recycling rates have barely moved at all in the last decade, from 37% to 43%, just a 6% increase. Now, this is not coincidental or unrelated. According to very worrying research by the House of Commons Library, the data from the 123 waste authorities shows a general negative relationship between incineration and recycling, aka higher incineration means lower recycling and vice versa. And I've seen this firsthand in Beddington, where I watched as recyclable material was put into the incinerator to be burnt. However, even I did not know how bad the situation was until I read research from Zero Waste Europe, which revealed that more than 90% of materials that end up in incineration plants and landfills could be recycled or composted. More than 90%. Quite apart from the obvious negatives that this brings, Burning these valuable materials in order to generate electricity can discourage efforts to preserve resources and create perverse incentives to actually generate more waste to ensure that these energy from waste plants remain economical rather than focusing on prevention and recycling. And again, I've seen this firsthand in Carshorton and Wallington, with residents asking what the point is in separating their rubbish into four, four five, six different bins, only if they get held in the back of the same lorry and end up getting burnt. I've also attempted to have it explained to me about the calorific value of waste and how uh, this waste needs to be burnt in order to generate this so-called energy from waste as some, some kind of perverse metaphor for a diet. Uh, now, leaving aside the problems of energy from waste, which again I know the Minister knows for well about from the discussions we've had about New Mill Quarter in Hackbridge, whose homes are supposed to be heated by this incinerator yet suffer high bills and regular outages. I appreciate that Bayes have done a consultation on this and I will be continuing my discussions with them. However, even with turning waste into energy, recycling is still the better option, as it can save up to five times the amount of energy that produced by energy from waste, which is not a renewable resource, creates toxic pollution, and emits more CO2 potentially than some hydrocarbon-powered plants. In other words, Mrs McVeigh, incinerators need waste to have an effective business model, whether recyclable or not. That isn't recycling. So this then begs the question, what is the solution? And I want to draw attention to some of the really good work being done by the government on this, and I'm sure the Minister will have more to say on these topics in her reply. The government has, in the Resources and Waste Strategy, set out its ambition to move away from incineration in favour of maximising recycling and, indeed, the, a possibility of an incineration tax. 
The Environment Bill brings in powers to introduce charges on single-use plastics and ban things like plastic straws, stirrers and cotton buds. The Deposit Return Scheme, which has seen recycling rates rocket in over 40 countries, is due to, become, is due to come here to the UK. There's a ban on exports of polluting waste to developing countries, single-use plastic packaging tax, plastic bag charges, carbon capture and storage funding, and indeed, that all-important commitment in the resources and waste strategy to moving to a more circular economy. So I do want to congratulate the government for the work that it has done here, but I would urge them to move at pace towards this circular economy. We must look further up the waste hierarchy to achieve this, so I do have a few asks. The next steps up our waste hierarchy are, of course, recycling and reusing waste. We've heard the startling figures already about how much recyclable material ends up in incineration, and this must be stopped. Things such as an all-in deposit return scheme to open up the concept to as many recyclable materials as possible, as well as putting new responsibilities on when it comes to sorting waste to prevent as much of recycling, recyclable waste ending up in incinerators as possible, is certainly going to be a good step. Because by removing recyclable and compostable waste from incineration, this will greatly reduce the need for incinerators, helping the government achieve its target of moving away from this form of waste management. But we all know that the very best way to reduce it is very best way is to reduce the amount of waste we produce in the first place. Even better than recycling, as it involves less energy, less extraction of raw materials, and so on. That is why there does need to be a much greater emphasis on reducing production, such as placing responsibilities on producers, incentivising minimal packaging methods, for example, making it easier, and indeed the norm, to choose the more environmentally friendly option, whether that be domestic products such as food packaging, all the way through to heavy industry. Indeed, my new hospital that is being built in the area has a requirement to be carbon neutral, and I really look forward to seeing how they manage to achieve that and the inventive ways they go about doing that. Uh, but Mrs McVeigh, it's clear that Carshall and Wallington has been failed when it comes to this incinerator by a council that is just not willing to act. Incineration may be marginally better than landfill, but it is not the way to boost recycling or create a more circular economy in the long term. We need to look further up that waste hierarchy and do much more to recycle, reuse and ultimately reduce the amount of waste we produce to help make that need for incinerators, like the one that has caused so many problems for my constituents, obsolete. The question is that this House has considered waste incineration and recycling rates. And I'm hoping to get to the front bench for about ten past five, which means people have got about six, seven minutes for their speeches. Alex Sobel. Thank you, Ms McVeigh. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And uh, I'd like to thank the member for Carshalton and Wallington for curious about I don't think I've spoken in debate with him before, and it was very interesting to hear about the local government politics of South West London. I have to say, Lib Dem councillors in South West London are no different to Lib Dem councillors in Leeds, and so I have some sympathy for him, and it's a shame none of them were here today to answer for themselves. I'm sure he'll agree with me on that. Um, although he might not agree with everything I'm going to say. <laughs> anyway, so sustainability is one of the biggest and most important challenges facing our country. On a finite planet, we cannot afford to run, throw a society indefinitely. In the UK, we're consistently missing household recycling targets, and figures show that over 70% of UK packaging waste has either recycled or recovered in 2017 disguise the fact that recovery actually includes incineration. The real recycling rate is closer to 45%. That's compared with 54%.